It's 10 a.m. It's Monday morning. It's time for Mr. Businessman. Morning. Um, <laughs> I just felt like I had to do that. I felt like I had to, you know, I had to start the uh, the holidays off with a bit of a bang. Um, welcome to Mr. Businessman Holiday Edition. Um, I know that I keep mentioning what the date is or what the day is or what the time is and things like that. And when I use these again later as resources and that it's not really going to uh you know work the same but uh i think it's important to try and keep uh <laughs> keep this current uh and uh <laughs> yeah just felt like it was needed um i hope you've been enjoying the um previous videos as well not only these um but the more important ones, you know, the uh, you know, uh, business explain with video games, which I'm actually really proud of. I think that's really good. I'm going to try to do some more of those. I've got a couple of ideas for different videos. Um, and there's been some cr pretty crazy things happening in the news. I don't know if you've heard, um, but we'll be talking about that later on in the stream, as usual, just before we finish. Um, but today marks the day. It makes a big, you know, it's a big change. It's 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 a start of week three um of mr businessman but it, it it's also um the the first week where we 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 go back to basics we we start again basically um and and it's important i'm not i, I don't want to i don't want to i don't want you to underestimate the importance of continuing to go through stuff that we've already been through because There'll be students who did, who weren't even on the course when we did it. There'll be students who've forgotten how to do it. They're the most basic stuff, but you'd be surprised how much you forget. So um, hopefully they're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time going, yeah, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah, yeah, that's obvious. Well, perfect. That shows that it's already ingrained in there. But if you are new to business, if you are brand new to business, and or if you're someone returning to business and you think, well, let's get the basic core um, ideas down, um, then this is for you essentially um and uh yeah just just make a list of things if there's any of the that you think oh yeah i forgot that or i couldn't remember that bit then uh, make a list of it and uh you know that can that can be the basis of the revision can't it okay um also um i think it's strange have you noticed people are trying to carry on as as they usually do like um talking about the easter holidays like this is the easter holidays right now but i don't understand how the easter holidays is any different than the other day uh, every day is the easter, hol easter holidays what i don't expect my students to do some stuff uh, for, a, for a number of days for some reason because it's easter but it's not really easter because it's not really easter till then it's not like i can go out it's not like i can go and see my mum and dad and go and you know have easter dinner or whatever it is that you do do you have easter dinner it's like christmas dinner in it but not as good um but yeah I'm babbling. I'm going to get straight onto it anyway, but uh, that's that's what's in my mind at the minute. Um, that and Craig David, obviously, because he's always in there, isn't he? So uh, <laughs> let's get straight to it, shall we? Um, we we're going to start off with the basics. We're going to go straight back to the basics. We're going to have a look over them. Okay. So um, the most important thing that we we remember when we're doing this is we've got to treat ourselves as if we were brand new business students that we've never touched it before. I'm going to be I'm going to try and explain concepts to you in the way I would have explained them in the first time we met, um, and uh, hopefully they will they will become pretty useful to you if because you you will need all this this is obvious stuff hopefully by now but if you don't then you think oh yeah i can't remember that bit let's have a look all right so first things first right at the start of the course is what we're going to do introduce the uh, key vocabulary identify various stakeholders who are affected by business strange isn't it how fast we get into stakeholders uh, you probably didn't realize at the time uh, define and public and private sector uh, define and distinguish between needs and wants Identify and, uh, the different characteristics of goods and services. Define with example the concept of opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is obviously a big concept that hopefully you've started using more and more. But if you haven't, then we're gonna we'll we'll do a little recap on it. But the public and private sector are really important right now. So I'm not just gonna be going over these basic concepts. I'm gonna be applying them to quite high end stuff. So I'm gonna it, it really is revision. I'm not just gonna treat you like you don't know anything. I'm I'm gonna try and explain them for people who don't know. But I'm also gonna apply them to the later on stuff in the course so it, it you know it's more revision all right here we go so let's just put some some things in in here i'm gonna just feel free to to, to hold this a second and, and have a go at it but i'm gonna have a look through it so it should be hopefully you you, you get it by now so the percentage of, uh, of sales in the market that are made by an individual firm 
market share. Um, how do we figure out market share? Can you remember? Market share formula is your market share over total market like value um, times 100. And that will show your market share. Um, the amount of money that's brought in from sales. Lots of people get it confused with different words, but what do we know? Hopefully, you know that's revenue. Any organizations owned or controlled by the government, you could all argue they're all controlled by the government, couldn't you? Um, although the government doesn't seem to be doing very well at controlling the rest of us at the moment. Uh, and uh, that would be public sector. Um, lots of people get confused with public sector because they get confused between PLCs, but we'll talk about them um, in the next episode, in the next episode, in the next um, video about private and public. We will talk about them later on, but PLCs and that come, come later. Um, anyone who is interested in or affected by a business, really important one that anyone who is affected or interested in a business, they're your stakeholders. Don't forget the importance of your stakeholders. Really, really important that we keep talking about them. Um, the amount of sales after all expenses have been deducted from the money, um, that's your profit, isn't it? Another one that people get confused with, strangely. Uh, any organisations owned and controlled by individuals or shareholders, uh, we've got our private sector. And an individual who takes a risk to set up a business. Now, people forget the risk bit. People who take risks, they're entrepreneurs, aren't they? People who like to take risks. They're not always the most innovative people, although innovation is quite a core concept of being an entrepreneur. Uh, they're not always that innovative. They're not always charismatic, although charisma, uh, charisma is uh, an entrepreneurial trait. Um, they're not always that well um sort of put together they're not always that smart they're not always that intelligent they're not always that you know there is and that's one of the brilliant things about business that entrepreneurs um can be from all walks of life anyone watching this could be a fantastically successful entrepreneur and it doesn't matter what your background is and uh, it's about you get up and go it's about your ability to take an opportunity um and take a risk so uh, let's keep going. So what is business? Um, the main idea I want to get in your head here is, is do you have um, an idea in your mind? Do you, do you have like a, um, your own definition? Do you know what it is? Like a lot of you watching now will be talking about revenue and about an ability to make revenue and an ability to make profit. Some of you will be talking about changing the world. And uh, it's, it's an important thing to remember this because... When you um when when you look at, at business, I think there has been a, a significant change between what you learn when you're at you know well probably primary school and things like that because um when you look at uh you know what is a business essentially because you, you already know a business to an extent um but there's because just through naturally you know interacting with these these places but. Um, what is a business? The interesting thing here is, is it about profit or not? And when you start getting to the end of the first year, sort of start of the second year of the course, and you start to think a little bit more, you start to get into the degree level stuff, you start thinking about this thing called uh, the triple bottom line. And the bottom line has always been profit, right? But what is a business is a big question because that could be a dissertation. That that would be a fantastic dissertation because we need to think bigger than that, don't we? We need to think: is it a is it a uh, an avenue? Is it a a tool for social change? Um, I mean, look at the minute, right? I'm going to take you back to me a second, <laughs> but let, let's just stop a second and let, just have a chat about this because let, let's look at what's happening in society at the minute, right? You've got all these different businesses that are being pelted by external factors, right? So you've got the government, you've got the um, you've got the economy, you've got coronavirus, you've got uh, stakeholder needs, you've got your shareholders being naffed off because they're not going to be making any money because the the economy is all in bits. Um, you've got um, your suppliers who aren't getting paid, who they're naffed off because they're not getting paid. You've got um, you've got your employees, they're freaking out because they're not going to get paid or they're asking what the hell is going on and, and your cash flows up the wall, so you're, you're freaking out. So everyone's freaking out, right? And then the media have the audacity, which I think, because I, I saw this the other day, right? And I thought it was important to talk about because I think people are really confused about how business works. Right, because they're sort of talking about the morality of business, and that's a strange concept. Whether we have a morality of business again, I don't want to get too deep considering this is supposed to be the basics, but I think it's important to raise really early on 
is what you think business is supposed to be. Do you think business is supposed to be an avenue for social change? Or do you think it's just a way of people making revenue and people making profit? If you think it's profit, it's easy to understand. But when you get to the higher levels, you start thinking, well, actually, all these businesses that seem to make a difference to people seem to make a change. They're the ones that get a good reputation. I read on Facebook the other day, someone was having a go at like Liverpool Football Club, which I think it's just Liverpool Football Club. I'm not into football myself, but I know people really seem to despise uh, Liverpool Football Club for some reason. I don't know. But anyway, or it was Manchester United, one of the big ones anyway. And they were having a go at the fact that the the um a very very wealthy club like them that were saying that their revenue um that this was the interesting thing they said that the revenue was something like 350 million or something uh it shows a complete lack of understanding of business because that doesn't mean the gross profit was 350 million i'm not saying that they didn't make a decent amount of money i'm sure they did from all the merchandise sales and everything like that but what they were getting angry about on Facebook was the fact that they were furloughing staff. Um, so they were putting them on a retainer, essentially. It's quite an American term, furlough. It's not something that we really use here. But um, you, it, you were basically like giving the staff 80% of the wage, which was which was given to them by the government. And people were getting angry that, they, that the, the football clubs um, were using what the government uh, had, had given to them because they were saying... Uh, how dare they do that you know they've got 350 million pound why are they doing that you know and then they were saying like um bill gates has uh, millions and millions of pounds uh, he should be giving money away well it's strange that you'd say that now and not say that any other time like if we get back to why these people you know bill gates he's got more money than he ever knows how to do with it if he wants to keep that in the bank it's his choice isn't it but ultimately he's quite um, a giving person in that respect call him philanthropist don't they he gives away a hell of a lot of money anywhere and he is trying i've heard that he's bought like seven companies that are trying to get get a virus uh, antidote at the minute so it's not like he's not doing his bit right but the second one is um, with the football club, it shows that people don't understand what business is for. Is it an avenue for social change? If it is, then let's let's treat them like they are all the time. Let's not let's not. You remember, you're talking about a company that's paying uh, millions and millions and millions of pounds so that a footballer who's already a millionaire a lot of the time uh, will go and kick a ball in a certain place at a certain time with a certain colour jersey on. Um. So I think we need to put it in context for the significance of the situation. Um, don't get angry that football clubs are, are doing what businesses do, which is to minimise costs and maximise revenue. They've got shareholders to think about or even if they're not you know even if they're not um privately owned like that even if there is an individual person he's put the money up or she's put the money up you know like that's not it's their money at the end of the day why should they you know if, if, if i said to you now all right well you can get your netflix for 80 percent off or you can keep it as normal not many people go oh i've got loads of money so i'm going to keep it as normal no, the, the economy is going to be in bits anyway. You might as well fill your boots, really. <laughs> like the, the government um, are already going to are already putting crazy amounts of money out there. So what's what's a couple of million more going to be? It really doesn't matter, does it? This is the tip of the iceberg. So I'm sorry that um, I went off on that massive diversion, but I think it's important because it's uh, it's it's current to what we're thinking now. But it's it shows the misunderstanding of business that people think they think it's like a, a personality. It shows the effectiveness of marketing really when uh, when people react like that, um, because they go uh, because they think that there's some kind of you know uh, it's just a decision like that. They're not thinking about all the all the moving parts, all the people that have to be paid. You know, would Liverpool football, excuse me, would Liverpool Football Club reasonably be able to survive? Uh, for very long with no input with no income with no revenue streams none from merchandise because no one's buying it no football sales because no one's playing it um no ticket sales and they're and they're expected to pay millions and millions to the to the staff not only the footballers who want an absolute fortune it's not it's not sensible thinking is it and it shows as i said i don't want to go on facebook uh, i feel more comfortable saying it here because you guys have come to me but um i don't want to say it on facebook because i probably get ripped to shreds as they don't really understand what the hell they're talking about but i understand the basic premise of what they're saying it's just absolute nonsense so sorry about that um so let's have a look at stakeholders anyway so i've talked about quite a few of them today uh, anyone who's interested or affected by business how many can we think about okay let's have a think about some we've got the government so 
So the government are stakeholders, the big stakeholders at the moment. I don't personally like people using the government as stakeholders in exam questions because I think it's a really, um, it's like a non-point a lot of the time that people have to make about it. Oh, they want tax. And you think, yeah, and where are you going to go from that? Good AO one point, but not really much better than that, is it? Okay. Um, but the important thing is that we understand the primary aim. So let's just go through those, okay? So let, let's have a think of some stakeholders. We don't need them all, but we but let's do the basic ones. What do the government want? Well, the government want tax, don't they? So if you don't know this, write it down. So um, they want tax and they want people to be employed. So they want revenue. They want, they want um, the, well, their revenue comes from tax, doesn't it? They want money to be able to spend on society doing things, ideally. And they want people to be uh, employed um, because it's it's... It's one of the main things that government are there to do, really, is, is to shore up employment, really, isn't it? And uh, so that's that's what the government want. What about um, shareholders? What do shareholders want? Well, shareholders are people who buy shares in a business, aren't they? They want a return. They want the best return they can get on their shares. So if I give you £100 and, um, and I buy shares with it, I want the most back from that £100 I can physically get. Um, that's the main thing that shareholders want. We're not saying they're immoral. We're not saying that they're not doing it for other reasons. And there's been this thing recently about, you know, or only investing, you know, nice businesses and stuff like that. That's a side issue. All right. They might be doing it for some, you know, save the world kind of reason. But the vast majority of shareholders, basically, in, um, they, they invest in things that they're going to make a return on. So the most return they can make. Um Customers, what do customers want? Well, customers are an interesting one because customers want the, the cheapest price they can physically get. Um, and they want the best quality they can get. So that's the two things that they want. They want the cheapest price and the best quality. Um, important one because people don't don't um, write that one down a lot of the time. Um, so we've got share, uh, shareholders, we've got government, we've got um, employees. Who else have we got? Uh, sorry, we haven't had employees. We've got customers, haven't we? So employees, what do employees want? Well, employees want um, a good wage, the best wage they can get, really, if they can, won't they? And a lot of people... And this comes back to our um, HR theory of sort of um, theory X and theory Y of what kind of um, sort of worker do you think they are um, is basically we're not we're not saying that that employees want to do the bare amount of work sorry sorry uh, the the bare minimum work and get the most out of it we're not saying that uh, interestingly enough. Because that would be quite um, a Theory X way of saying it. McGregor's Theory X. Remember, we, we talked about it ages ago, but it will be in a much, much later video of that if you if you need to come and research it. Um, it the basic premise is that people... Uh, Theory X says that um, people inherently want to do the basics and they want to do the least amount of work they can and theory why workers want to do a good job just because they want to do a good job and they want to do... They don't mind doing more than they have to. Um... So we're not saying that in stakeholders, employees, interestingly, their wants isn't to get the most money that they can for the least amount of work. It isn't that because that that wouldn't that would be presupposing a hell of a lot. And, and there's whole bits of, you know, the spec and, and business theory based on people um, watching, basically, and, and the, the effects of those. Um, but yeah, so what we're really saying is that they want a good wage, you know, to be able to pay the bills and to be able to, you know, feel happy in that. And there's all the other extremes we, we do with motivation theory and that that employees want. So they want a, a decent wage and they want um, security of employment as well. So they're the two things that they really want is that they want a decent wage um, and security of employment. And weirdly, security of employment is a really, really important one. Um, the more you get into it, the more you get a mortgage, security of employment. Look at the state of the economy at the minute. You know, if, if things are all over the place, aren't they? And I think it doesn't matter when you watch this video, whether you're going to watch this video in 10 years' time, because I'm damn right I'm really still going to be using these um, if I'm still teaching. Um, and uh, the, the, the interesting thing is the... You know, when the economy is like this, the security of a job is so important to people. And rightfully so. You know, it is for me. I'm in a really privileged position because I'm a teacher. I'm public sector. I'm fine. You know, like, you know, I, I have the ability to go home and, and, and get involved with you guys and stuff like this and do what I can. But there isn't going to be someone, you know, sending me a P45 thing or P60 or whatever. Is it P45, the ending one? 
um, trying to get rid of me because you need me. You know, I'm a public sector worker. It's like trying to get rid of the. It's like you know, furloughing the police or something like that. We don't get furloughed. We just we just try and carry on and to the best of our ability. So you know, that's a big one. So what else have we done? Is there anyone else we've not done? Yeah. What about um. What about like pressure groups? That's another one as well. People always forget about pe pressure groups. Pressure groups is a stakeholder. And pressure groups are people like um, sort of anyone who's trying to put pressure on your, uh, your business to change your ways. So I don't know if you can think of any, but the, the big ones that you, use, you usually hear about are things like uh, PETA, uh, protection, what is it? Protection uh, of the mistreatment of animals, something like that. That wouldn't that wouldn't work, would it? I don't know what PETA stands for. P E T A. It's an American thing again. We're talking a lot about America today, aren't we? Um, but the big ones uh, in this country are stuff like uh, you know, people like Oxfam and that. They're not just a charity. They're, they're a pressure group. They try and put pressure on people as well um, to to sort of make make social change and things like that. Um, uh, what was the one? Um, Greenpeace. Greenpeace would be a better one. You know, like more, they are they're, they're a hell of a lot. You know, Greenpeace will uh, will take donations and stuff, just like Oxfam. But Oxfam deal a lot with the um, uh, the sort of trying to solve the problems, but they also put pressure on governments to try and do things and things like that. And that's what pressure groups are. So Greenpeace is a really good one. Try and save the planet. You know, try and save trees. Try and you know minimize the amount of damage we're doing, which is a good a good idea, isn't it? Um. So if we got we've got employees, we've got customers. We've got shareholders. What about owners? We haven't talked about owners, have we? Owners. Um, and when we talk about owners, we're not talking about shareholders. We're talking about privately owned uh, businesses. So um, owners want um, a good good return on the profits, essentially. That's what they're looking for. Like, it's not really more difficult than that. I mean, they obviously want the, the business to continue and they want a steady stream of revenue and things like that. But the main thing they want, they're looking for a return on investment and they want the business to achieve whatever they're actually in it for, the, whatever they're looking for. Um, we've also got things like managers. And managers um, is, a, is a weird one as well because managers, you'd think they're interested in certain things. But the main thing I always say that managers are interested in is managers are, are interested in achieving the aims that they've been set. So usually it's cost minimization that they're trying to do um, the vast majority of the time. Um, but uh, it, it could just be something like if they're in marketing, um, it could be to achieve a certain amount of sales or it could be achieve a certain amount of people understanding the brand or appreciating the brand or, you know, a new amount of likes on Facebook or, or a certain amount of watches on YouTube or whatever it is that they're trying to do. But the vast majority of the time, managers are looking at cost minimization um, and profit maximization um, in that regard. Have we talked about most of them? I think we've talked about most of them. There may be one or two other ones that we haven't mentioned today, but it's not the end of the world. As I said, we come, we, we talk about stakeholders constantly anyway, but they're the main ones. Um, so as long as you've got, got a copy of them. So um, how do they influence business activities? Now, this this is much more of a, you know, a wider question, isn't it? How do stakeholders affect business activities? And the, the real answer is it depends on the situation of what, the business is doing, um, what they are currently, what what situation they're in, what's the economy like, what's all those external factors, and um, because remember the the business can only react to the situation they're in, can't they? Um, so th th it's a bit of a it's a very wide question that how might they influence a business? You know, I want you to take them in, take them in turn. Um, you know, employees could have a big significant impact on business, couldn't they? If they were particularly skilled, if the employment rate was very high in the country then you might say well employees actually have more of a say at the minute because it's difficult to replace them because everybody's employed uh, if the employment rate was low in the country then it might be less important to listen to your employees because you can just replace them anywhere so who cares uh, can you see what i mean so it just depends on the situation so always look at the, the context of whatever it is you're talking about let's move on um, public sector and private sector. Okay, now public sector um, is made up of organisations which are owned or controlled by central or local government. Uh, when we're talking about local government, we're talking about council stuff. So council stuff it still counts as public sector. But bit, main ones you need to remember for public sector um, is all your um, things like the uh, police, um, NHS. Uh, I know if you're watching this abroad, then it doesn't apply. You'd have to think about things which are owned by your states uh, at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, National Health Service, um, Fire Service, Police, 
um, waterboard, you know, that kind of stuff. And when I say waterboard, I don't mean that torture technique where you put, um, you know, th never mind. Um, but, you, you know, like, um, the, and we used to have a hell of a lot more in this country that was privately, uh, sorry, publicly owned. We used to have, you know, all the stuff that said British on it used to be pub uh, publicly owned. So like uh, British Gas, British uh, Airways, British Rail, um, all those, they were all pr uh, publicly owned. They were all owned by the government. But then um, the it was mainly um, Margaret Thatcher's government that, that, that sold a lot of it off, which is strange, isn't it? How is the government allowed to sell stuff off if it's publicly owned? That's ours. We never said you could, pr we never said you could sell that off, but I don't want to get into it. <laughs> I just hate it when governments do stuff like that um, because it could come in quite handy sometimes, couldn't it? Um, hence why the NHS is so important right now, just to, you know, uh, as, a, as a spring, it's not like none of us n didn't know that the NHS was particularly important, but of course it is. Look at the state of the, the, the place now and we're, we're really relying on these people, aren't we? So, you know, hands up to those people for, for doing what they're doing. Um, the army is another one, you know, publicly owned, um, you know, why not privatize it? You know, privatize the army, let, uh, <laughs> let people invest in it. Um, no, don't do that. So um, schools, colleges, education is is public as well. Um, although, here's one for you. When they say public school, they mean private. So that's confusing, isn't it? So you have, you have uh, publicly run schools, but they're not public schools because public schools are what we know as private. Um, I don't know what we call public schools then, as in ones that the public go to, not private. Um, I think they call them state schools or something like that. Like, I don't know why they don't just call them public because it would make more sense, wouldn't it? So when someone says, oh, have you been to public school? They mean, have you been to private school? Um, which is confusing, isn't it? But anyway. Um, so private sector includes all these businesses which are settled by individuals or groups of individuals, including shareholders. Most business activities undertaken by uh, the private sector. So in, uh, examples of these really easy ones, Nike, Coca-Cola, um, Apple, uh, Topshop, uh, any business that you can think of is going to be private sector, pretty much, other than, you know, the very, very anomaly, anomalous ones that are the public sector ones. Um, so any big brand is going to be private sector. Um, really easy to remember. Uh, but most business activity, most of the stuff that helps to helps uh, get revenue into the country and helps uh, people continue doing what they're doing, tax to be paid and things like that, uh, are all um, private sector. That's why the economy is in such a state at the minute, because the private sector has just halted. Uh, they just stopped the private sector. You know, when Boris Johnson came out and said, uh, stop working, basically, to everyone except us, they told us to keep going, didn't they? Um, the the uh, the you know the leisure industry in this country massive massive thing, uh, and to stop that pubs and bars and things like that uh, is huge. You know that's why, and, and I don't mean to be really depressive today, and and I hope you're watching this in the in the future when everything's blown over, um, but that's how I know this is going to take a while. You know, if people think that we're going back to college, you know, in the next couple of weeks, is they're living in a fancy world because there's no way that the government is ever going to going to do this again. They're not going to. They're not. They would have never have done this if they had any opportunity to not do it. So I really, truly believe that this this country will be on standstill for a good amount of time. Um, and I think this thing about you know, all oh, twelve weeks and we'll all be back to normal. No, I think twelve weeks and then we're. We, we have a look at the situation and see deaths are going up and up and up aren't they i don't mean to uh to, to go off track again but it's not like it's not like it's working you know people are being morons and going out and just um you know or that's what it seems like anyway i don't know if you've if you've seen loads of people out and about yourselves when i've been out for a little walk um which i, don't, I only do every couple of days as well um the, there's been quite a few people out so hmm. Anyway, aims and objectives. Let's have a look at them. So, um, a big one is, is aims and objectives, the, the first basic stuff. Um, to enable organisations to fulfil a common purpose, it is important that they specify the aims and objectives they wish to achieve. So, business aims are long-term. What a business is trying to achieve, perhaps in three to five years. So, when we talk about the aims of the business, we're not just talking about uh, the, the, the sort of wants right now. We're talking about the overall aims. It's the sort of biggest thing we can talk about so aims tend to be uh, qualitative and more difficult to measure but provide an overall focus to work towards so when we're talking about aims it'd be saying like um, when people say uh, oh what what's your aim in life and they say oh, to be happy oh that's useful isn't it that's that's really good so that's that's measurable 
Um, the problem with that is you can't make it smart, can you? So business objectives, um, when we're talking about business objectives, business objectives are ways that we achieve that aim. So if your aim in life is to be happy, then you have to find out what happiness is in terms of find out what makes you happy and then find, and then list a, a number of objectives that would allow you to access that happiness. Um would be the most effective way of doing it, wouldn't it? So objectives are a method that used to achieve the aims. It says objectives should be set that relate to the achieving the aim, like we said. Uh, objectives should be smart. That means specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Now, a couple of those in the smart thing actually kind of mean the same thing, don't they? But let's not get into that now. Uh, objectives are quantitative um, and more focused on sort of more focused and thus achieving these works towards the overall aim. So let's put it in example if you say oh i want to be um my overall aim is to be happy and i say okay what age do you want to be happy and you say i want to be happy when i'm 30 and i say okay what are you now and you say i'm i'm 16 now i'm 17 and you go right well what i would suggest you need to do then is you'll probably need some cash to be happy not because cash gives you happiness but cash gives you choices um, and very few people who have very, very little money are particularly happy because they have a lot of lot of other um, worries that you or I don't have because we're usually okay. I mean, if you're watching YouTube, you must be decently, uh, have, have a decent amount of money or at least okay because uh, to have access to this kind of medium. Um, but the... Yeah, I think it's uh, it, you, you don't realise that there are issues. You know, you don't have to worry about where your next meal's coming from. You don't have to worry about where your next pair of pants is coming from. You don't have to worry about, um, <laughs> you know, if you want to go and do something, you can just do it. And that's um, that's something that money gives you. It doesn't make you happy, but it, it does give you choices. And, and a lot of happiness stems from choices. A lot of people are, are upset at the minute because they're stuck indoors. Uh, and that's what the they're upset about the lack of choice the fact that the choice has been taken off them to do it they probably wouldn't have gone out anywhere i mean all my hobbies are indoors anywhere um <laughs> so it's no problem for me uh you know like it's a bit depressing that i you know i like to go out i like to go to the shop i like going shopping and at the minute i don't want to go anywhere near super supermarkets but uh other than that you know so why set aims and objectives? Well, there's a couple of things. First one's it's motivational. You know, if we don't have any... Like, look at me at the minute, right? I don't have to do this. This is this is, this is is Easter now for me, apparently. Um, although I don't really get that it is. I don't, there's no need for me to do this. There's no requirement for me to do this. But it's motivational. It, you know, I'm motivational. I'm looking to the future. I'm trying to be proactive. I'm looking... It gets me up. It gets me working. You know, like, having this is, is a positive thing for me. And I hope it's a positive thing for you as well to give you some structure but, and to go over the stuff. But motivation is a really, really important thing in business. It, we need aims and objectives. We need to be able to keep pushing ourselves, to have expectations. Even when someone's not watching us directly, when the world's in chaos, are you going to just relax then or are you going to keep pushing? Because personally, I want to keep pushing because I'm bored. I want to do something. I want to do something creative. I want to do something positive. Uh, and you should t you take the opportunity to. That's what successful businesses do, you know. Um, coordinate the department activity. This is a good one as well. It actually gives you... We're all singing from the same hymn sheet, essentially, aren't we? Um, it gives everybody the idea of what we should be working on. So when someone says, right, what's the overall aim that we're working on at the minute? And they say, oh, well, the current aim is to uh, minimise costs. Then we know that any opportunity you get to minimise costs is going to be really good for that company. It might get you a bonus and stuff like that, but it, at least you know that you're working on the thing that the business wants you to work on. And you can feel more comfortable that hopefully feeds back into the motivation. Allocate resources where they need, they're most needed. Um, much easier to actually give stuff out. Do this person need that? Does that person need that? Um, can we give it out to more effective places? You know, Because remember, there's only a certain amount of resources that we actually have. Um, can identify improvements can make it much easier to, to make improvements which is a, a really important thing um, it's always hard to know what your weaknesses are and where your improvements could be you know I think with this channel would it, would it be improved if I bought a green screen I don't know perhaps maybe I should get one um, <laughs> and it allows the checking of performance if we don't set aims and objectives then how are we going to check whether we achieve them so that's why you know in college we um we or in education in general um we set people tasks we set them objectives we give you a target grade we give you something to be working on um and then we say right okay well uh, if you're currently at this stage this is where i want you to be or this is what you should be aiming towards or this is what i need you to be working on and why because it allows us to check performance there's no point of um how how are we supposed to know whether you're doing well or doing what you should be doing if we've never set you a target okay 
Um, common aims and objectives for the sectors. Okay, so private sector have slightly different ones, but they're always, you know, basically the same. Uh, profitability. So private sector is all about revenue streams. Remember, we the main thing that they're for anyway. Remember, there are other things that, you know, being good to the world and, you know, making a positive impact. But the basic thing, the most um, obvious one that most businesses are for is profitability. So including break-even, if you remember, we've done that. Um, sales and cost minimization. Increasing shareholder value, so we want to make sure that the business is um, as uh, the is as useful, as um, buoyant, as um, powerful as as it possibly can be. Um, survival, one that people always forget. Survival, you need to survive, especially you know people start making businesses and expecting them to be doing really well in the first couple of months. It's very unusual. Um, especially with 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 less experienced staff or less experienced entrepreneurs in charge of the business, uh, the the survival aspect is a major major uh, aim, and it should be your main aim for the first couple of years uh, that you're trying to do your business for. Um, again, people forget about it, and then it, when when we have um, you know crazy stuff happening in the economy, it uh, survival becomes most important again, doesn't it? Survival becomes the uh, you know the be all and end all essentially. Um, what else have we got? So gaining market share, big one, uh, become more dominant. Remember, if we, we want to become a price maker, not a price uh, taker. Uh, we, need, we need to have that dominance in that market. We need to be uh, making sure that we feel uh, more comfortable with that and, you know, um, able to, to move, you just sort of in, increase uh, market share when we can. Increasing brand identity, um, big, big one. You know, do people know about it? Can you be the Nike of your industry? Do people actually know about your brand? Do people know about your um, style? Do they know about the way that you are or things like that? Uh, ethics and going green. Um, again, side issue, I think. And a lot of people seem to think that this is what the world of business is about. Um is secondary, I think, at the moment, because if you don't make money, you won't ever be able to do this. If you're ever interested, there's some uh, fantastic show, uh, Peter Jones. Uh, if you go on YouTube and type in Peter Jones, you'll find a um, a show called How We Made Our Millions. Brilliant uh, show about Peter Jones, uh, the dragon off Dragon's Den, going around and interviewing different owners of businesses. Um, and it's interesting to hear the difference of opinion of Peter. Peter Jones is a serial entrepreneur, a very, very successful person. And he just, he, he knows he'll invest in anything that will make him money. He doesn't care what the subject is, really. He's not bothered about that. He's bothered about whether it'll make money. And that's what you seem to see of entrepreneurs. They don't care. They just, I'm not talking about him do something really, really immoral and, and do it because of that. I'm, I'm talking about like, he doesn't care what the what the industry is. He'll imply, as long as he can see that there's going to be a profit and he's be confident of his investment, he'll invest in it. Um, so maybe that's a word to any of you who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. Don't get held up on, oh, I really want to invest in this market. I really want to invest in that market. If there's profit to be made, fill your boots because that's how they do it. Um, new profit, uh, sorry, new product or market development growth. Um, pretty self-explanatory isn't it making new products take different to the public sector though public sector if you remember are owned by the government and they're they're there to provide a quality service to provide value for money for the taxpayer because remember we're funding these things you might not be funding them right now if you don't pay a tax but you will be funding them at some point probably uh provide for customers or consumers needs remember customers and consumers don't have to be the same thing a consumer is someone who consumes the product a customer is someone who uh, buys the product it doesn't have to be the same thing you could have a customer who isn't a consumer and vice versa um and yeah big thing is don't waste taxpayers money that's one of the main features of this is is one of the main reasons that they, they, they aims for the for the government to, to, to keep on with it now goods versus services and we're, we're nearly done so don't worry you know we're we're uh, we're on our way um goods versus services um one of the first things that we talk about and that that people forget is uh these different ones so um different types of goods number one is consumer goods what are consumer goods well consumer goods are bought and used by consumers sounds obvious doesn't it but we do have a name for it and an, an example would be food uh, clothing that kind of stuff electronics uh, producer goods are used by the business in the production of other goods so machinery office furniture cranes that kind of stuff so you could potentially have something that was the same, but it's unlikely. Producer goods are things that we physically use to make things. Because the interesting thing now is 
Um, if I was class myself as a business right now, which I'm not uh, at this moment in time, I'm not registered or anything, I'm not doing this for any money. Um, so I'd be a pretty unsuccessful business if I was a business. But this is an interesting one because I'm using my computer, which is a consumer good, but I'm using it to make content, which if I was a business would be my way of making revenue, which would be would probably make it a producer good, wouldn't it? Interesting one. So it can change. Depends on the situation. Uh, durable goods uh, don't get used up um, in con through consumption. We don't use them up when we're using them. So I can use my uh, my Mac again and again and again and again. It doesn't get used up. Yes, there will be some wear and tear, but it's not like eating a Mars bar. Mars bar ends when you eat it. Or you can't just have the Mars bar back at the end. It'd be good if you could, though, wouldn't it? Uh, and consumable goods, goods that do get used up in consumption. Okay. Now, um just one here so it says in which ways might a business act differently around goods and services that are needs or goods um that rather than wants i think the big one that you can remember here we're going to talk about want, wants and needs a little bit um but the big thing to remember is if it's a want it's a lot lot more um price elastic and income elastic essentially because if you remember about price elasticity of demand um, and the fact that, you know, how much do you change the price by will affect how much demand changes by. If it's really elastic, meaning that there is, a, um, you know, a comparably larger uh, amount of change to the um, demand than there is the price. So we change price by 10% and, and demand will change by more than 10%. Um, if we looked at something like that for a uh, a want then it's of course it's going to be because people aren't really that bothered are they people will chop and change with wants it's not the end of the world um if if we want something even if we really really want something um but with needs people are willing to um to buy them at any cost are willing to go and you can see at the minute uh, businesses have been being uh, being trounced on people by uh, because uh, they've been putting prices up haven't they now that's just supply and demand again i think that's just supply and demand rather than businesses trying to exploit the situation um even though that's kind of what businesses do <laughs> i don't know why people are getting angry at businesses again when uh, that's what we're here for we we, we exploit situations uh, and we make as much revenue as we can oh well you know there's a global pandemic on businesses should be pulling together no well yes yes they should but that's not what businesses are about businesses are about making money so you know it's uh <laughs> it's a difficult one you're kind of asking them to go against their own uh you know their own aims and objectives there aren't you now uh characteristics of needs and wants um economists describe the basic needs as foods warmth shelter clothing developed countries you could probably add free education healthcare a civil society good infrastructure infrastructure if you remember is your roads uh your sewage systems your things like that the things which allow you to get from a to b uh um lamp um what are they called street you know, street, what are they called? Oh God, it's gone out of my head. Um, street lamp things, what are they called? Uh, <laughs> God, I'm sound like I've lost my mind. Um, you know, the uh, lamp posts, lamp posts. That was it. I knew it was lamp. I was like, street lamp? No, no. Um, and wants are what people would like to have, but are not essential. So if you want a new mobile phone, uh, a bigger house, a swimming pool, a private nurse for your grandmother and so on, um, people's wants are unlimited, but the limited resources. So this brings us back to the basics, doesn't it? Of um, that, the 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 core concept is that resources are finite in terms of there's only a certain amount of, of them, but there is uh, an infinite number of uh, wants that that people will never be satisfied, and that is how we basically run our economy is we use money to dictate who should get what then, shouldn't we? Because if there's only a certain amount of resources, how do we decide who gets what? Well, we decide who gets what by giving them, uh, giving people money and allowing to buy buy the thing. Um, so just quickly, uh, really, really quickly, get these down for me. Um, are they a need or a want? Let's have a look. I mean, these are pretty simple, aren't they? So feel free to pause me. Um, you don't have to. Food is a need. Luxury caravan is a want. Games console is a want. Uh, but I really need that. I know, I feel the same. Um, water is a need. Shelter is a need. Mansion is a want. Okay, let's move on. Now, last thing I want to talk to you about today, really, before we look at a past paper question, because I want to focus on them as well, um, is opportunity cost. All right. Now, opportunity cost is basically... Um, 
the idea that if we do one thing, we have to give up the benefits of another. So I'm here talking to you right now. What is the opportunity cost of me doing that? What's the opportunity cost of you being here with me right now? If you're watching this live or even if you're watching this at any point, what is the opportunity cost of you spending this time looking at um, you know, business theory? And the opportunity cost is whatever you have not done today because of that. Whatever you are not spending this time doing now, that's the opportunity cost of you sitting here. So I'm spending an hour. I mean, what we on? F 46 minutes at the minute. Um, so the last 46 minutes you've been here with me um, looking at business theory and you didn't sleep. Uh, you didn't, um, you know, but I say that. I don't know what you've been doing. You could be doing anything. Um, but for example, I didn't sleep. I didn't play on my Xbox. Uh, I didn't take a phone call. I didn't have a Big Mac. I didn't, you see all these different things. There's all the, anything that I could be doing that I'm not doing right now is the opportunity cost for the situation. It's a really, really important bit of business theory that, and something that people talk about uh, in modern day-to-day -day stuff anyway, isn't it? So, um, and this is, this is one that economists out there, if you, if you, if you're looking at maybe studying economics or if you, uh, you, you will study them a little bit, even if you do a business degree, you will study a little bit of economics when you get there. And um, it says the basic economic problem, unlimited wants, limited resources equals uh, scarcity. And what is scarcity? Well, scarcity means there's not enough for everyone. So what do we do? We give cash out, don't we? We make people earn cash to be able to, some people have more so they can afford more. Uh, some people have less that they can afford less. I might do the economic problem. I'm thinking um, of doing uh, another... Um, explaining business concepts with uh with video games i'm thinking the next one might be on the economic problem because i've got a really good idea for it so i might have a go at that uh, i need to get some uh I need to get my mate to send me some some stuff though because i get him to do the the video side of it because i have got um, an elgato somewhere but i, I can't be bothered for it, putting it in um, anyway, so what is opportunity cost? Well, the, the definition is uh, opportunity dis uh, cost describes the benefit of the next best option foregone. Even if you just remember that. So it describes the benefit of the next best option foregone or the next best alternative foregone, which means it's the benefit that you have given up, the next best alternative, the next best thing that you could have had. So if mine was still being in bed, um, that's that's the the benefits of me being in bed in terms of the fact I'm more rested, the fact I'm happier, that kind of stuff. Um, that is what I've given up by doing this. All right, they're the they're the things. Now, that's it for now. That's it. All I want to talk about is an exam question now. All right, if we can spend a little bit of time, really, really quick. Um, and we've done some of these questions anyway, but I just want you to you know we need to keep going over these because because it doesn't matter if we do the exams right now, but they are coming. So it says, in recent years, farmers have found it increasingly difficult to make a living um, from traditional farming. Uh, now, interestingly enough, you guys will be able to tell me more about this situation. Now, why is that? Well, it's because of things like economies of scale, isn't it? The reason is because they're giving purchasing economies, which means that they might not be able to um, sell the product. The unit cost is going to go down and down and down. We also know about market dominance. We also know about market share, you know, uh, the, the, the dominance that people get from having a very large market share. So supermarkets having a very dominant market share like tesco can push their suppliers uh, eg milk farmers to put their price down but push them so far that they can't actually make a living uh, and this has been something that's been happening more and more um and becoming more and more of a problem uh, over the last couple of years um Many have been looking at additional ways of increasing their income. For example, John Evans, a Pembrokeshire farmer, is considering investing his life savings of 50 grand into creating either a small caravan park or a trout farm on his part of land, as well as carrying on with some traditional farming. I'd suggest immediately do the caravan park because trout farming surely can't be that lucrative. Um, stay out of farming. It can't be that lucrative at the minute because of these dominance and supermarkets ruining it for everyone. But it says, using the passage, explain the meaning of the term opportunity cost. So let's just have a look at our AOs. Now I'm going to do a separate video on AOs. I'm assuming you know what AOs are for now. So let's just go over them really quickly. But AO1 is your knowledge. AO2 is your application to the case. AO3 is your explanation of what's happening and you, you sort of... Um, your explanation of key concepts. Um, and your number four is your evaluation. So looking at the, the, the benefits and disadvantages and, and weighing up a justified conclusion. Um, but So what AOs do you think we have on this one? So using the passage, which one's that one? Application, AO2. Explain the meaning of opportunity cost. It must be AO1. It's just explain in terms of, you know, just tell us what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it has to go into anything else. Um, 
Okay, so we've got AO1 and AO2 there. Now, I've actually done these, haven't I? So the trigger word is explain using for AO1, basic knowledge, using the passage, use the context. So I'm gonna, I've got one here. Uh, I've written you an answer. It says opportunity cost describes the benefit of the next boss opportunity for gone. So start with the definition. Remember, lots of people are forgetting to do that now, but start with the definition. Always put a definition in. You don't get any... Uh, I mean, in this one, you'll probably get a mark for that anyway because you, it's mainly an AO1 one. But even if it was an, a, a bigger question, always start with a definition on the off chance that you've caught the rest, rest of it up. And... Um, I'm looking to give you marks. Remember, examiners will always try their best to give you marks if we can, even if you've messed the whole things up. Sometimes um, it's important to, uh, you know, we, we'll try our best to try and give you something if we can, if there's even the, the faintest of something. Uh, that's why it's so important to never leave a, an exam question blank because the only thing you guarantee by doing that is that you have earned no marks. Uh, we will always try to give you something, but we can't give you marks for not doing anything at all. Um, it says the benefits lost um, of not choosing the second best option in this case. So into our um, onto our uh, sort of A or two stuff. Uh, John Evans decides on the caravan park he will lose or forego the benefits that he would have gained from the tri trout farm or vice versa. If John Evans decides on the trout farm, the benefits lost will the caravan park. There you go. Done. Four marks in the bank. You know, take it to the bank. There you go. Really, really good. So, at the end of his work placement, uh, placement, Jack's boss offered him a full-time job as a sales, uh, a car sales representative on a fairly good salary. Remember, salary is different than wages. Wages are hourly paid. Salary is yearly paid. Jack's parents want him to go to university, but Jack is unsure what to do. How does this situation illustrate the concept of opportunity cost? Another one. How does this situation illustrate? So, we know we've got AO2. You guys will be experiencing this yourselves. You're going to have big decisions to make in the next couple of uh, months or the next couple of years um, and your opportunity cost is massive i know students get freaking out about opportunity cost um and these people who go stuff like oh yeah well i'll go back to college at night no you won't they offer you know oh i know someone who did that well come on you know the real world gets in the way i couldn't do this now what the, the fact i'm doing this now is the fact it's unusual isn't it when would i ever have the opportunity my opportunity cost is not having a youtube channel that's full of business business videos because i'm a teacher i go to work i'm i'm busy and yes i could um i, I when i get in i could do one of these instead you know when i'm absolutely knackered from work i could come back in and i could do this but i'm not going to um, and I've got my family to look after, you know, and stuff like that. And I've got Xbox to play and I've got, you know, Netflix to watch. The opportunity cost of me doing this would be massive. At this moment in time, it's not that great because I've not got that much to do anywhere. You know, I've got the stuff that I've got to do. I've got marking to do and things like that, like I always do. But, you know, this is the, this is, this is the opportunity cost of me doing this at the, at the moment is very low, whereas usually it would be very high. So how does this illustrate it? Well, you've got to basically just say that, look, if Jack wanted to go to do the the sales uh, placement with the salary, he would forgo the uh, the benefits that he would get from going to university and vice versa. If he went to university, then he would forgo the salary. Um, I mean, on, t on terms of that, not to go, you know, too far into it, but of course he would, he would, he would benefit a lot less um, probably in, in the grand scheme of things by having thing uh, by, by going with the, with the salary because at least if he had the degree if he was to lose his income um if he was to lose his uh, lose his job and things like that he would hopefully find it easier to get another job not to say it's guaranteed but he would hopefully find it to be a little bit different uh, a little bit easier to get a job than if he'd only had one job just saying i think uh, you know i can only i can only go from my own experience but i think education is pretty, pretty useful i always think the it's one thing that they can't take off me isn't it my education i'll always have gcse's i'll always have a levels that kind of stuff um final one uh, if you want a little bit of homework to be doing because i know you do Choose and research any business and create a mini fact file. What sector is it in? Is it public or private? What are its aims and objectives? You know, is it mainly based on uh, revenue or is it mainly based on trying to do other things? What stakeholders might be interested in it and why? Um, whether they, they provide needs or wants or whether they provide goods or services. Really, really nice, you know, 20 minute little thing. Pick a business that you like, do a little fact file uh, and keep it with you so that you can remember what it is. So, um, yeah. That, that's the start really that's the start of this and uh hopefully it's drawn your attention to the fact of some of the stuff that you maybe have forgot about or uh, you know has been pretty useful if you've never heard of it before but let's have a little look at the news let's find out what's going on uh, in the world of news uh, today let's go to the bbc as we do every day 
Um, interesting, yeah, since we last spoke, uh, Boris Johnson has been admitted to uh, hospital, um, apparently under a completely advisory thing, uh, but um, it's not looking good, is it? I mean, that, that's that's not, not a good situation when he was saying how he, uh, he wasn't really affected by it. Um, now, an interesting one as well, people are still talking about when will we know if this uh, lockdown is working and how long is it going to affect businesses for, how long is it going to affect the shutdown for. Well, when people are still wandering about and doing ridiculous things and going to the seaside and blah, 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 well, I think it's going to be, you know, taking a while because people are still dying from it, aren't they? And it's going up and up and up. Um, I mean, look at this. And, and, and as I said, it makes it so it's so admirable what these people are doing. Camping out for the NHS raises 80 grand. You know, like it's it's such a good thing, you know, that, that people are doing these really positive things, aren't they? Uh, look. Um, teachers making maths. Um, what have we got? The DT teachers on site staff are making 900 of these masks. It's fantastic. But you know what? It, it, it needs to be raised that this is insane that they're asking normal people on the street to help a system which should literally be one of the, <laughs> the best funded in the world. You know, like... And this is the problem, isn't it, now? Of, of no one seems to be really um sort of taking uh you know take taking taking a part of the fact of it, i don't know it's kind of like the fact that yeah we'll applaud applaud people for doing the bit you know that's fantastic yeah do, do some stuff make some stuff but why the hell have they got they not got it anywhere why the nhs not already got these things we're not a third world country you know we're one of the biggest or we were one of the biggest um sort of economies you know really really you know powerful economies um i say we were because of brexit and that but um we we were supposed to be this dominant force and we can't even provide our national health service which is publicly funded with the necessary stuff that we we, we can do it's insane absolutely insane that and, and someone should be held responsible for it and i have to say it i don't mean to point fingers but this guy i point the finger at um because he's has to be the one who i have to point the finger at because he is currently in charge of the government that has been in power for 10 years and hasn't has majorly underfunded the nhs um and and here we go you know like this is the situation so fair play to these people who are doing the bit you know fair play to these teachers who are making you know ppe stuff and that's fantastic but it, just the same in business we're looking at the um we're looking at the the effects not the um the the causes here and i think the causes need to be thought about big one as well uh, debenhams to file for administration you know a massive big dominant force i called this <laughs> i'm getting better and better at calling these businesses just before they go under but uh, we we got some debenhams um vouchers for christmas um off my father-in-law and uh i i said we need to go and get them spent immediately because uh you know and my wife was going oh it's, i don't even want that specific thing i was saying we'll just buy it anywhere because uh, you know it's really important that we get them spent because you might not be able to spend them soon it says debenhams is to file for administration after the coronavirus lockdown forced it sh to shut its shop across the uk uh, it described the process as a like touch administration uh, to protect it from legal action from creditors while the department stores are closed interesting one this is what we're talking about right the impact of stakeholders creditors are not happy you know suppliers need paying uh, look at my Mario uh, cash flow video if you need any help with um, the idea of cash flow forecasting. But yeah, they could go after them. You know, like at the end of the day, um, they owe money. And, the, and the, yes, it's a horrible situation, but creditors are going to need their money back as well. We've ta so he said, um, we've taken this step to protect our business, our employees and other important stakeholders. And he said that it will allow Debenhams to resume trading from our stores when the government restrictions are lifted. Interesting, but I don't think so. I think this is the start of the end for Debenhams, really. So if you do have any Debenhams money, um, then please get rid uh, while you can, because you, you might not be able to do it very soon. Um Let's have a look at one last thing. Let's have a look at, as, we, as we've talked about stakeholders today, um, let's have a look at this one. Uh, we'll finish off with this one today, shall we? So, coronavirus, under 25s and women financially worst hit. This was 59 minutes ago. You know, I like to keep it fresh for you on the, on the stream. Uh, young workers and the worst paid and women um, will be most affected economically by the coronavirus, a study has found. A remarkable concentration of those groups are employed in sectors that have shut down. The Institute of Fiscal Studies have discovered. It said that the research raised some serious worries about the longer-term effects on the crisis on younger people, especially um, and inequally. In 
inequality. Sorry, inequality. <laughs> Those with the lowest earnings were particularly hard hit, the IFS said. And the, the research comes from the UK's confidence that the economy has fallen to its lowest in 12 years as the COVID-19 uh, crisis drains consumer confidence. Uh, remember, if you if it's not really the economy, you know, recessions are caused by confidence, you know, things like that. It's not hard to get people to buy things, but it's it's hard to get them to spend their money. Um, the research comes as the it says the research from um, GFK's consumer confidence gauge dropped minus 34, a decline of 25 points. It suggested a record grocery sales were not enough to counteract the stark outlook for the retail industry. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing which is going to break the camel's back, isn't it? Obviously. Um, and it is a big issue. Interestingly, I read a thing the other day as well. I'm going to have to try and find this for you. But I read a thing the other day. Um, sort of, I love hearing sort of contrarian points of view and different random things. You know, it's important to expose your mind to these uh, contrarian ways of thinking. And, you know, people just coming out with crazy things. Because you might go, well, that's absolutely mental. Um, but it, sometimes it, it actually helps you. Um, and they were talking about, I'm going to have to find it. I'll try and if i don't find it today I'll, I'll try and find it over the next few days for you but basically what they were doing was they were, they were saying that um people who earn less choose to earn less sometimes and that inequality over gender or age or things like that is sometimes by choice and we don't underestimate we, we, we underestimate that premise of the fact that some people aren't motivated by money so then if you get um, a certain demographic of people who aren't um you know necessarily motivated by money as much as other demographics then it might look like there's an inequality between those two demographic groups when that's not necessarily the case um you know um what do they say um correlation doesn't mean causation there might be a correlation between uh, earning less and being a certain gender or being a certain age but it doesn't mean it's caused by being that certain gender or being that certain age I, that's not my view but it was the view of the of the contrarian sort of guy who was talking about he's a psychologist and i thought hmm i've not never thought about it like that but an interesting one he seemed to have some good good stuff to report him back so maybe we'll have a look at that at some point in the next couple of weeks on the stream um anyway uh, i'm gonna leave you there for today because we've just done our hour and um, and i know you're all eager to get off and you know uh, enjoy your holidays um <laughs> but thank you very much for joining me and i will see you all at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning peace out <laughs>